Okay, guys, let's just start with. I'll just give you a brief update. I put in a few more. Uh, we are not using this file that often, but whenever I see, I put in a three more. Uh, this is for you guys who are uh, those who want to add uh, additional. Okay, guys, too much talking going on here. No talk. <coughs> I've given you YouTube links to three interviews of um, uh, people who have uh, very good, they're very important things to say about the market. So one is these are people for I don't know why I'm giving you all this because you're not even doing the material that has been taught. But if you want to add to any of that, uh, there is a guy called Ray Dalio who's a very famous hedge fund manager. He manages one of the largest hedge funds. So anything you get by these three guys. So one is Ray Dalio, and then the other is uh, Howard Marks. And then the other is, uh, you can see the names in the, this is in your uh, file where we put in all the random links, okay. So there's Ray Dalio who manages a hedge fund, okay. The hedge fund is an alternative asset management maker, it's one of the largest hedge funds, Bridgewater. So you can just generally find anything on the, on YouTube by Ray Dalio and you can just uh, watch those videos, okay. He's very knowledgeable and uh, in fact I'll give you one of the videos uh, specifically uh, but uh, just find anything that he's this one he's talking about Ar Argentina and Turkey and all those cases but very knowledgeable person all three are very knowledgeable so read anything you have and use that name to search on YouTube and dig up anything okay Howard Marks Howard Marks is I'll uh, just tell you a little bit about Oak Tree uh, because you've heard about you studied value investing okay so typically when you read and I've given you some of those classic books to read right so most of the classic books on value investing, they would deal with value investing from an equity uh, point, uh, equity standpoint. Okay, so for the asset class that we call equities. Okay, so typically most of the discussions, the theory of value investing, it's all been developed with respect to equities. Most of the literature is on equities. So what Howard Marks is, uh, runs a firm called Oak Tree, Oak Tree Investments. So what these guys do, they are actually what is called a distressed debt investor. So you can actually think of them as they are value investors, but they don't operate in equities, they operate in debt. Okay, so they when they see, remember what does a value investor do? Uh, he buys uh, he buys when prices are below fair value or above fair value? Below, below fair value, right? When prices are, prices are far below fair value, then he will go in and buy. Okay, with the view that it will move back to fair value, right? <coughs> so these guys do the same thing. Oak Tree does the same thing, he's a very big investment manager and uh, they do the same thing except that they do it in the case of debt so they find bonds which are they wait till they find opportunities to buy bonds which are trading far below what they think is the fair value of those bonds okay and so it's exactly value investing but it's applied to debt which is a little unusual because most of the value investors operate in equities so howard is a very knowledgeable investor and he also writes a letter he writes a letter to his investors once in a while every once in a while these are called notes so you can read those notes also you just go to the oak tree website pick up the stuff very very knowledgeable people you can learn a lot from uh, these guys and the third one is a guy called jeff kunlak who manages one of the largest uh, bond funds okay so he also is a very knowledgeable person he runs a company called double line capital so you can go to the double line website he has these podcasts and re research reports so anything done by jeff kunlak you can read up it's very very knowledgeable you learn a lot about uh, what is going on uh, in the market and how to look at markets. So these three, I, I thought I'd just add these in your uh, general sheet. You can follow up if you want for further knowledge. Okay. Okay. Now let's go back to what we were doing. I just need to show you something on, I'm just going to open this. Uh, I'm just going to show you how, because the problem with this particular software that we are using is uh, that it's not uh, as high quality as the TWS. Okay. On the TWS, the order, the order terminology. Remember all these terms that we learned: order or market if touched, yes, stop, yes. and all that. Those are all classical, and those are all perfect terminology. But on Wanda, what you will find is the charting is much better than TWS. But in many other ways, they are not an optimal uh, platform. So one of the things that they don't do right is the terminology that they use for orders. Okay. So I'm just going to explain to you in the context of, remember we've looked at three ways to enter the position yes. at market, yes. worse than market, better than market, three ways to enter the position and there are three orders associated, at market is which order? Market, market order. Okay. Worse than market is what order? Stop order. stop order. Okay. Stop or stop limit, whatever you want to use, but that variety and better than market is limit order. Limit order. Okay. 
limit or no 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 again you're making a mistake again somebody asked me the same thing in the other time don't make this confusion okay guys let's get this clarified <coughs> Let me. sorry I'm just gonna remove the or I think just let me just pop out the chart okay there is some confusion here still about it just shows you how important the order types um, module is <clears throat> but it's it's surprising that people are still confused now let's say MIT is only used uh, MIT is used for entering the order can be used for entering the order also but the difference is let's look at it this way that if <coughs> Yeah. Yeah. So normally, actually, MIT is used for exiting existing positions. Okay. Yeah. That's why. But you can also, if the view is there, I think, strictly speaking, we can say that you can use MIT on the for the entry as well. But there's a difference between the the difference in the view between MIT and limit is that in the case of uh, the limit order, you don't expect uh, a limit sell order or a limit buy order you don't expect dramatic price movement after that particular price is reached okay so if i want to buy euros at 114 okay and i feel that the euro will go to 114 and it will hang around there for a while there won't be any dramatic reversal okay then i would use a limit order because the difference between limit and mit is that the limit order guarantees my if i give a limit buy order at 114 that means i know that it will be bought at the highest possible rate at which it can be bought is 114 okay it may be better than 114 but it will buy only at 114 okay? highest possible rate is 114 okay but in the case of a market if touched if i give a mit order with 114 okay it's a little unusual but then what will happen is that that order i would only place when i my view is that the euro will drop very sharply to 114 and then very quickly it will rebound from 114 so there is a if i give a limit if i give a limit buy at 114 in that kind of scenario what might happen is if my view is correct it will go to 114 and it will maybe trade only once at 114 okay and somebody else's order might be ahead of mine and then it will never see 114 again so if i give a limit buy order in that situation it will not get filled my order won't get filled because the system won't fill it if it can't get 114 or better right okay so that's why you give a market if touch to ensure that you get the execution you have this scenario that it will touch 114 okay so it's a very complicated view that you have you have the scenario that will sharply drop to 114 it'll touch 114 but after that it'll rebound very quickly so that's why you're giving a market if touched order because once that 114 touch happens you want to quickly get in at any price you follow the logic some people are still looking confused you're clear now yes, sir. okay so that's why so it's a different view but generally what happens is market if touched is not used on entry position and entry uh, orders it's used on exit orders generally although theoretically there's no reason why you can't use mit to enter also okay so typically if you take that normal situation then mit uh, then the limit order would be used to enter into positions also also to exit into position exit from position but the mit would be used so in this case if you take limit order to buy uh, the euro you would put place a limit buy at 114 and then once you have a long position you would might use a market if touch that if you say 118 it will go to 118 and then sharply drop then you use a market if touch to sell but i think it's better from a theoretical perspective if you think of it just based on your view okay so the difference between the mit and the limit order is really based on your view of how the price action is going to evolve if you feel that the market will go to a particular level touch it just touch it and then sharply fall or sharply rise then the mit is more appropriate okay and you want to enter or exit the position at that once that scenario unfolds is this clear everyone's following okay so uh, and then in the case of a limit order when you expect more orderly price action okay it's not going to be dramatic if you just have normal price action then the limit order is more appropriate because it ensures that you get the limit price okay clear okay so what was i talking about let's uh, let's just uh, okay now what is going to happen here there is a bit of a problem in terms of the three order uh, order types okay let's look at this if you just right click on this now let's say that i want to um, okay so let's say i want to buy the euro at 114 in which case this is quite i can just right click you can have keyboard shortcuts also f1 is help f2 is 
uh, buy at market, F3 is sell at market, F4 is buy limit <coughs> and F5 is sell limit. Okay, these are shortcuts, keyboard shortcuts. Otherwise, you can just right click in the area I want to buy at 140. So if I right click now, you can see here, maybe you can't see here properly. Um, maybe if I do it here, does it, no, it's still, now you can see, you guys at the back, Sushant, can you see this? It says market buy, market sell, entry buy and entry sell, okay, it's a little bit, this terminology is not correct, okay, it's using this terminology, essentially what it, yes? it's showing the spot price. So these, these are spot. This is these are spot charts, spot euro, spot foreign exchange. Okay, which is an OTC market. So these which prices? And that entry buy at the rate. Yeah, it's just telling you based on what. Remember, I co I uh, bought it at. Um, uh, I've clicked. I must have clicked at that point. You can pick the point. See if I if I go to one thirteen and now it's just giving one twelve ninety five. It just looks at. It looks visually at what point of the chart you have clicked. Okay, so if you want to place an order near 114, you go to 114 here, position the cursor here, then you right click, then it will give you a price which is close to 114. Okay, so the entry buy that it's placed is actually the entry buy is not the right order, but I've clicked the entry buy. Okay, it says entry order. This terminology is not correct. Okay, so you go by the TWS terminology. So what this essentially means is a limit order. Okay, in this situation. It means it's a limit order. So if you want to buy a, or if you want to buy limit at 114 on the euro, this is what you would do. You put in your number of units, okay, and then you put in the price, okay, expiration. You can put it further out if you want, okay, three months, just to be on the safe side, and then <clears throat> that whatever you can put, whatever you want, okay. Take profit and stop loss. Also, you can enter. Still trailing stop. We don't need to worry about at this point. Um, <clears throat> did I discuss with you how how you use the 7.1 to proxy the solution to 7.2 by moving the stop. Yes, sir. No, 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 I've discussed it. No, no, okay, okay, fine. So we'll discuss the trading stop when we do that. Okay, I thought I'd discussed it, and anyway, never mind. And upper bound, lower bound, also, you don't need to worry about at this point. Okay, so. <clears throat> All right, so you can actually estimate what your stop is if you're going in at, at, and when you when you're going in Okay, now that's as, as far as the limit buy is concerned in this situation. Okay now Let's say your view is so far everyone's following the market order is very clear So there's nothing to worry about the market order is okay market buy and sell is okay The entry the limit order terminology on the system is not correct So you have to just tolerate it, but in your mind you should always have the IBTWS framework that is the right definition of the orders, the right nomenclature also, okay? So use the, is this clear? Use that in your head, but this system you need to know how to operate. Now, so as far as entering at market is concerned, if I want to buy at market, all I do is, I will just do F2, it comes to market order, okay? And I can just put in, and if you notice here, the rate will keep changing. 115.28, 115.27, it keeps on changing because I've entered market order. So the system, this dialog box will keep on updating the market price, whatever the market price is uh, by the time you enter your order. So it keeps on updating. So if you just press F2 for uh, market order, you can just right click and choose market buy. Okay, if I want to do market, I can just choose market buy, that's one. Now entry buy, If I said, as I said here, if you want to do a, a limit, if you want to do a limit buy, you want to enter at a price more, more favorable than the current market, you just click here and you do an entry buy and then you enter this part okay this is for your limit by order now <clears throat> even more com complicated is actually the third situation where you want to buy at a price uh, less favorable than the current market okay let's take let's take something realistic which is what you're actually going to be doing <coughs> okay let's say that i feel that the oil price will come down even more okay this is not actually um, this is not um, Okay, let me let me just do it this way. So let's say that your underlying position, obviously, in this project, your your underlying position is long. Okay, so you are concerned about falling oil prices. Now let's say that you feel that uh, at this point now the oil price is not going to fall anymore. It's going to go. Uh, it's going to keep on going higher. Okay. So therefore, you feel that at this point it has now already bottomed out, 
and it will keep rising 75 76 all the way to 85 etc so then obviously your preferred uh, your uh, uh, basic plan is to sell the oil price we can talk in terms of a basic plan and a contingency plan okay so when you operate in the markets whether you are operating as a hedger or a speculator you need to think in terms of a basic plan and a or a primary plan and a contingency plan Okay, you can call it primary, secondary, whatever you want to call it. Okay, so the contingency plan is what you activate if the main basic plan doesn't work out. Okay, so basically, start things start going wrong. What do you do? Okay, all right. So your basic plan obviously is to sell the uh, sell oil at a hedge oil at a much higher level. This is clear. Basic plan follows from your view. Okay, your preferred view is that oil prices have now bottomed out. Now they're headed sharply higher. So obviously, according to your basic plan, you're uh, expecting to hedge oil at a much higher price than what you see now okay that means you're entering you're planning to enter the hedge at a much higher price than what you have now which is some 69 80 or something like that is everyone following i don't know why everybody is looking blank is this clear according to your yeah so that's what you should say if you're not able to understand so what i'm talking about now is just to understand this uh, peculiar nomenclature of orders that they have here okay so how would you operate in a, in a hedging situation how would you operate okay if you're like an oil company trying to hedge its production which is what you're doing here similar to that so <clears throat> you have this view you look at this oil price chart and you feel now this oil price big decline from 77 now this decline is over that's your view it will rise again. now you feel that the oil prices are now headed straight up this is your view okay so obviously you will hedge according to your view okay so if your view is that is obviously going straight much um, is going straight uh, high, uh, you know up now okay it's going much higher obviously you will not hedge at this point Do you follow Th does it make sense okay that you don't hedge now because you think that prices are going to shoot up okay so that's why i'm saying that your basic plan is to hedge at a more favorable price than the current market okay it's, a, it's to hedge at a more favorable price than the current market okay so <clears throat> in that case but what happens if if so you will sell maybe you have a limit order to sell at 85 or whatever okay because your view is going to shoot up to 85 now so that's fine as if it if it works out that way then it's fine okay but what if it doesn't work out okay if it doesn't work out you need to have a contingency plan okay if oil prices instead of actually shooting up if they start collapsing then then what will happen your underlying position will keep on losing more and more money so you need to protect that at some point of time okay so what you can look at is basically this then what you do is you have you have to have a plan now what is your view your view is that this is the i'm just zooming in now this price of 6860 okay roughly 6860 is the <coughs> you can't read the far I, I don't know if you guys can read at the back there 6860 seems to be the low okay right so if then if this is your view that this is or the low has already been made on the oil price now it's shooting straight up now what happens if the oil price falls below 6860 what does it uh, does it uh, imperil your view does it je jeopardize your view you will, lose you will lose money plus but essentially what does it mean for your view it means that your view is wrong is this clear it means that your view is wrong or the assumption you can think of your view also as an assumption okay your assumption was that oil prices have now bottomed and they are now heading straight up okay and based on your assumption you have taken a decision not to hedge at the current market right these are the options available to you you could have hedged at the current market okay or you could wait for a slightly better price and then we'll come to the third part which is you sell at a price worse than the uh, current market okay you hedge at a price worse than the current market so first you take the view and your view is such that this oil price movement has this has already bottomed out now it's going straight up okay so you can think of the view also as an assumption you have assumed that this long decline from 77 has ended at this whatever this point was 6860 okay you have assumed that okay and based on that assumption your action has followed from your assumption so therefore you have decided not to hedge at the current market and therefore you're waiting now to hedge at a much more favorable price is this clear because in hedging you have the entry price decision still has to be solved the buy remember what we discussed in the previous class that the buy sell decision does not need to be actively solved because it is automatically solved your underlying position is long so in the hedging and the as far as the hedging is concerned you are always a seller because your underlying position is long okay so therefore the buy sell decision remember connected to the decision problems okay whereas in an active risk book you have to actively solve the buy sell decision you need to take a view on the asset 
and if you think it's bullish then you buy if you think it's bearish then you sell okay but here the buy sell decision is automatically solved because your underlying position defines the buy sell decision your underlying position is long so your buy sell decision is always to sell okay is this clear are you following like you have given the example like you have studied jet fuel that the underlying position was in the jet fuel market but the hedging position was in the other market of crude oil but the crude oil will hedge in the same market now no 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 one sec yeah in this case you will hedge in the same market, same market now. yeah so yeah, here it's only applicable for jet fuel market that we will hedge in the crude oil market because of its liquidity yeah that also you need not always do that because you could also decide to hedge in the jet fuel market directly you could take an otc market hedge using a jet fuel swap that is an option that is available but that is not as liquid as crude oil futures so you could also hedge in the jet fuel market so for the purposes of this discussion that jet fuel crude oil basis risk aspect that aspect need not be brought in here we are discussing the current case and we are discussing yeah you can understand it's, it's okay to bring that in because you are connecting the idea which is a related idea but here we are discussing only crude, uh, crude oil so we are not discussing that question of which market we are not discussing the question of which market to hedge in we are discussing the question of the entry price and i'm just highlighting again that the buy sell decision is already solved automatically but the entry price is not automatically solved the entry price is basically you see that in the hedging in the hedging scenario the entry price is what you are actively solving all the time right you are trying to decide what price at what price should i hedge and that requires you to take a view on the market because here your assumption or your view is that the oil prices are going to just shoot up now so obviously you would not hedge right now because if they are going to shoot up then you can hedge at a much higher price later on are you following yes sir okay so the action the decision follows from the view that's why we have to be so focused on financial markets and understanding financial markets and navigating learning how to navigate financial markets because all decisions are based on views on financial markets you have to take a view on particular markets okay on the particular market where you uh, where you are operating so now if your assumption is that uh, prices have already bottomed and now when they're going to shoot up now if prices fall below the 68 60 level okay if they fall below the 68 60 level what does that mean what does that say about your assumption no wrong, wrong. assumption is wrong okay so now remember logically if you took a decision based on an assumption and now you find that the assumption is wrong what should you do with the decision stop sir say exit yeah you have to exit you have to unwind that decision basically if it is possible you have to unwind the decision okay in certain business situations where you have already started building a plant you may not be able to unwind the decision but you might have to try and sell it or something so like that hold the position if it has not followed that point. holding the position is not logical we have to act in a logical manner this is where the this is where your formal training in finance uh, should help you or should uh, should play a part rather than operating like many people do in industry they just operate haphazardly oh it's gone now no no i want to hold on to my position i don't feel like selling this is not the way you should operate in a, you have to operate logically all your actions must be logical if you took a view when you said that the long decline from 7710 has already entered at 6860 that's a specific statement that you have made and in, ter in terms of your as, as, as an assumption we can call that an assumption okay so if you are now you are based on that assumption you have taken a decision to sell at a you had an option to hedge at market okay but why did you not hedge at market because your view was or your assumption was that prices are going to shoot up so obviously you would be foolish to hedge at market if you think prices are going to shoot up so they would go to 85 dollars etc so you could get a chance to hedge at 85 so why should you hedge now hedge now at 69 80 right so that's your assumption now you have to operate in a logical manner okay everything is in that is the right way to operate okay you can always decide to operate in a haphazard manner but that is likely to lead to long term problems many companies have gone bankrupt because they did not have a systematic hedging program <coughs> that's why they have gone bankrupt okay if you have a systematic hedging program you may have losses but you won't go bankrupt because everything will be under control okay all right <coughs> so you will have budgeted losses only okay so so the way to operate logically is that if your assumption has been invalidated then a decision that you took based on that assumption should also be unwound as far as it is possible to unwind it this is clear to everyone yes logical yes. okay so now what you have to do is what was your decision your decision was not to hedge your decision was to refrain from hedging because you expected much higher levels okay 
so if your decision was not to hedge now you have to do the opposite of that you have to unwind that which means you have to you have to hedge now okay so that's why the way you should operate logically okay if you want to operate logically the way you should operate is you come in closer to this and you see whatever 68 60 this level is okay actually 68.71 okay 68.71 is the lowest level you can actually use this cursor and find out what the low level is so 68.71 okay now i'm just going to give you now what do you have to do therefore that means when you take a decision you should already capture your decision or your preparation should already reflect both the basic plan and the contingency plan so your basic plan was to hedge at much higher levels okay because your view was that the price is going to shoot up okay but you also need to have a contingency plan in place which will protect you if your basic plan goes wrong if the basic assumption goes wrong then it should, should protect you should have a plan to protect yourself if the basic plan goes wrong that is your contingency plan okay so the other thing you have to do is first you take a decision not to hedge but as part of your contingency plan you should actually have what kind of order at 6871 stop sell order right you should have a stop sell order what will happen with a stop sell order is that it will get you into the short position okay so whatever is like if your total position is 1 million uh, barrels you want you might want to leave it for a thousand barrels or five thousand barrels on this platform you can only trade for a thousand barrels at a time okay so you have to do multiple trades because they want to match it but these guys are hedging these guys are market makers okay Oanda. they are actually like unlike tib which is a broker these guys are market makers so they actually have to hedge their own position so they have matched it to thousand thousand barrels means one contract one contract on the nymex okay so that's why they're going to hedge themselves so that's why they have put a limit of 1000 they don't want to have more than one contract exposure at a time from one person okay so what you're going to do is so that's a limitation of this platform okay on ibtws you wouldn't have had this constraint uh, but anyway so what you're going to do is you need to place a stop sell order now this is where i'm going to show you how this peculiar terminology works okay so you have to enter an entry sell order okay now this is a very peculiar terminology that they're using is actually your stop sell is also going to work like this okay what is going to happen is entry order you notice that it's a sell you can see that okay so 6871 we saw so let's say that let's say i have units of 1000 units okay 10,000 won't work 1000 units so 6871 okay so i can so there's three decimal quotes third decimal up to third decimal so 68 so what is immediately below 6871 we have 6879 let's say 6879 is immediately below this okay so it's just like i'm saying that as soon as 6871 breaks okay that means my view is wrong so i need to enter my uh, short position okay i need to enter the hedge <coughs> now see what happens here server has accepted the order now you see what the server is showing um, yeah you can see that little order there yes what does it say at 68.70 okay so now on a proper system the reason i'm highlighting this method of entering orders is on this particular platform is that it is actually not consistent with what i have taught you to, so far in terms of orders this should have been accepted by the system as a stop sell order okay but this is how you enter stop sell orders on oanda okay that's why i'm saying that operate like this only for the purposes of using oanda and knowing how it operates but don't make this your uh, theoretical uh, don't bring this into your theoretical learning okay the theoretical learning should be based on what you learned earlier okay the, which is the way the tws operates that's the terminology are you following what i'm saying here Yes. that this should have actually been called by the system this should have been labeled by the system as a stop sell order but actually they call it an entry sell order which is not the correct way normally the market we don't because it is because uh, here what has happened is a limit sells they are for them for them as, as far as they are operating that's why they would have already sold it if it was a limit sell they would have already sold it okay but because the current market price is higher than the limit set so this is the peculiar way in which the software software operates so there they know that it's not a limit sell because it is below the market because the sell order is below the market so they know from that logic they know that this is not a limit sell 
Because if they had accepted it as a limit sell, they would have sold it immediately. Because the current market is higher than your price of 69.79. 69.709. Is this clear to everyone? How the peculiar logic operates in Rwanda. So this is not the correct terminology for orders. So keep that in your mind. But this is how you have to operate the software for the purpose of this project. Okay. So this is how your thinking should also be uh, when you're running a hedging program that you take a view on the market okay for all decisions in finance you have to take a view on the market you take a view on the market your view on the market essentially becomes an assumption it is an assumption about how the market is supposed to behave is this clear it's an assumption and then you should also clearly place the advantage of operating from a technical method like again we're going to use ta for technical analysis and fa for fundamentals the advantage of ta is that you can operate in a very specific manner if you make the specific statement okay you take a very specific view you say that okay this downtrend is over okay this downtrend from 77 10 is over at 68 71 okay you make a specific statement you can always do that if you take a specific enough view the advantage of ta is that it gives you very uh, you get very objective and very quick feedback from the market when your assumption breaks down mm. see here the if you make the statement that the decline from 7710 is over at 6871 okay that means that if the price breaks below 6871 your view is wrong or your assumption is invalid okay so this is the advantage according to me one of the advantages of ta is that if you do it in a sufficiently intellectually honest manner or not what tanu just say i want to hold on to it even though it has gone down there's no logic in that if you operate logically if you operate logically in, in a highly disciplined manner the advantage is that in ta that the market gives you very quick and objective uh, feedback very quick and object uh, understand what is happening here from a theoretical perspective because if you as a general theory in every realm of life you can say that uh, you have an assumption and you make some certain everything is based on assumption most of the most of the things we do in life and business everything is based on assumption ccd opens a new uh, uh, outlet okay that means what they're assuming there's going to be a lot of foot traffic there people are going to come in and drink if they think there's nobody's coming here no, why would they open an outlet they've made some assumptions that every day we'll get some 50 customers or whatever 70 customers right so everything is based on assumptions and then everything is uncertain in the future so you don't know whether your assumption is actually going to come out to be correct so the advantage in TA is that it gives you <coughs> very clear, the market gives you very clear, uh, think of the difference here. Like if let's say uh, a, a CCD opens a new outlet, okay, assuming that we will have uh, 70 customers every day and they are going to spend an average of 200 rupees, okay, on that in that outlet. Now this is an assumption based on which obviously they expect this to hold out after maybe uh, over a period of six months or one year. Now if let's say the, the bet is actually not working out, if people are not coming, do you realize how difficult it will be for them to understand and how much time it will take for them to understand that this thing is not really working out? Because they can't go on one day's activity or two days activity, they have to give it some time, they have to see for three months, six months, nine months. Are you following what I'm saying? Yes. In a normal business decision, you can't really figure out, it takes a long time to figure out that my assumption was wrong. And usually that assumption is just what I said that we are going to assume that we are going to have 70 customers in this shop and they are going to spend an average of 200 rupees per, uh, per visit. Okay. Now these assumptions don't just fall from the sky. They are based on other assumptions. They are based on maybe another metro station was supposed to open nearby or per capita income is going to go up by this much. Okay, middle classes will, the number of the people in the middle class will increase by so much. Are you following what I'm saying? These assumptions are based, business decisions are based on all these kind of assumptions. So actually you don't know which, at which part of the chain, okay, the assumption has gone wrong. Okay, so it's very difficult to figure out in the real world of business, which assumption has gone wrong. Every decision is based on assumptions, so the assumption is no longer valid. Uh, you should unwind the decision. But the problem in, in the real world is, that it takes a lot of time in most business situations to figure out to even understand that your assumptions are not working it takes a lot are you following what i'm saying you get the feel that to understand that your assumptions about gdp were not correct your assumptions about inflation were not correct okay assumptions about industrial production was not correct it will take a long time for you to figure out okay so now the advantage of ta is that uh, that would happen if you're using fa kind of analysis the what I'm trying to show you is something to understand when you're trying to choose 
between methods like many of you had this question like Goel used to ask this question that should I use FA or TA okay so one of the things you can look at okay uh, that in TA if you take the if you are sufficiently intellectually honest and you're disciplined okay it, the market gives you because everything is based on price your view is also based on price okay so the market gives you instant feedback as soon as your assumption breaks down you get to know okay so that's what I feel that it because what happens is remember what I told you about uncertainty okay the problem in economics and finance okay in financial markets I mean as far as the economy is concerned is the level of uncertainty is very high this is not physics so physics we can send and now we are sending more probes to Jupiter and Mars and this and that we can do all that it may actually take five years to reach there but we can actually predict how exactly the thing is going to move because the gravity of this planet, their orbital uh, path, nothing is going to change. Okay, it will, it's the same as what it was 50 years ago or 100 years ago. Nothing is changing. So that's why we're able to do all these wonderful things in physics. Okay, on engineering. But you have to understand that markets, the economy and financial markets, they are totally different kind of animal. Okay, the level of uncertainty is extremely high. Okay, so the most of the prediction that you are going to do, most of the prediction uh, tools that we have. Okay, most of them are actually effectively, as far as I'm concerned, they are effectively useless because the level of uncertainty is so high, and uh, you know it, it might as well you know just toss a coin and decide whether to buy or sell. It's, it's almost that bad. Okay, so uh, now the the point is here that that's why what happens is because the uncertainty is very high. Okay, the focus needs to come down to what is called risk management. That is what happens if your initial decision is not correct. How do you manage your risk? What is your risk management plan? Are you getting the flavor of this? Remember, I told you Lloyd Blankfein also mentioned this once. Okay, who is Lloyd Blankfein? <coughs> now you don't remember. Lloyd Blankfein is a retiring CEO. Now he's already retired. He's a retiring CEO of uh, Goldman Sachs. So former CEO of Goldman Sachs. Okay, so he he's a trader. Okay, he comes from a commodity trading background. So he was also he was being discussed. He was being asked about the economy and all that, economy and markets and all that. So he in that interview he mentioned that I focus not so much on prediction, but rather on managing the risk. Okay. So you make an arbitrary prediction. Okay. You can almost make an arbitrary prediction. Okay. Or if you make a methodical prediction, also is fine. But you have to have a very good risk management plan because most of your predictions are going to go wrong. So how you manage your risk and how you manage your positions when the uh, when the forecast does not go right that is much more important in e in uh, in economics and finance okay as compared to physics physics you don't have to worry so much you know, the only thing that goes wrong is you know maybe you had a faulty part like one of the SpaceX rockets blew up why not because the technology was wrong there's nothing wrong with their model or anything because one of the parts was faulty so obviously if you put in a faulty part then if it passes quality control then you're going to have problems right so the advantage that I'm putting what I'm coming down to is that risk management is obviously very intimately connected to the idea of your assumption breaking down okay remember because everything is based on assumptions all your NPV models that you have done okay all your project analysis everything is based on assumptions that there will be good sales of this particular product so that's why we will have such high sales numbers that's why the NPV looks good so that's why you accept the project okay but those sales numbers that you put in and those earnings numbers which come from the sales numbers so the real uncertainty is really in projecting the sales that's where the major uncertainty is so all that is based on a bunch of assumptions that's all it is okay because you don't know what the future is going to be it's all it's all based on a bunch of assumptions and the problem in those kinds of analysis okay is that it's very hard for you to even figure out when the assumption actually gone wrong the assumptions may have already gone wrong but you're not going to be aware of it until much much later and so what i'm saying is therefore risk management is very connected to the idea of breakdown of assumptions and you should be aware that your assumption is broken down okay so what i feel is one of the advantages of ta is that that if you have a if you make a take a view on ta the market gives you instant feedback that your assumption is broken down okay so that gives you a head start in terms of managing your risk if you know instantly that and it's and there's no confusion about it here there's no confusion because this is an objective uh, piece of information the market price of oil is now below 6871 this is objective information nobody can have an opinion about this it is true okay so if that the moment that is true the market has already told you that assumption is wrong so you get instant feedback okay and that is that gives you a head start in terms of managing your risk are you able to get a sense of what I'm saying so they also told that 
fundamentals, the information can be wrong. But in technical information, can, charting cannot be wrong. Yeah, something like that you can say because fundamentals, the assumption flow, that is strictly speaking not, uh, yeah, in, if you look at the inputs, okay. So if you look at the inputs that go into your technical analysis, the inputs can never be wrong because the inputs are all price, historical price, this cannot be wrong, okay, this is always correct, okay, the historically, uh, this is always correct. But in, in FA, what happens is if you're working with GDP data, like GDP data, typically you get three revisions. Okay, so if you are working with the first revision of GDP data, okay, you are working with the first revision of GDP data or the first estimate and you are using that as an input in a model, that input itself could be wrong because the second revision and third revision might change that number. As you saw in the US in second quarter GDP, first it came out as 4%. I think first it came as 4%, then it came as 4.1 and now it has come down to 4. Point, come up to 4.2. Okay, so those are actually big variations in terms of that if you look at the size of that number. Okay, so uh, so this is what I meant. Even in inputs in FA, the inputs could change, could change, and there are some measurement errors also. Even the third estimate of GDP need not be 100% correct because there are measurement errors in GDP, statistical problems, all these kind of problems. Inputs, those relate to the uncertainty of inputs. But here I'm talking about another thing, which is the breakdown of assumptions. In TA, the advantage is that the breakdown of assumptions is immediately telegraphed to you by the market. You get the information so you can really start to immediately manage your risk. And this is an advantage. Okay. So that's what I'm saying in terms of a long lecture. But are you getting the feeling of what I'm saying? When it comes to choosing between TA and FA, this is one of the things you can consider. Okay. That this is good. So now you know what has to going back to uh, I wanted to show you how to operate this particular piece of software because the order terminology is not correct. So is everyone clear now? Okay. And we have also learned something new again or we have refreshed this idea that you take a you have a basic you form a basic view on the market. Okay. Your primary view on the market. That's like an assumption or a set of assumptions. Okay. And then uh, if you are using TA you can formulate a point on the chart below which or above which that assumption is clearly proven to be wrong okay so if the assumption and based on your initial assumption you took a decision okay and so if the assumption is wrong the decision should be unwound okay so you do the opposite okay so that's why in this hedging scenario you have a very bullish view on the oil price so your basic decision is not to hedge in terms of entry price you decide that no i am not going to enter at market i am going to enter at a price much more favorable than the current market okay but if my assumption is wrong i better have a plan to at least hedge myself uh, you know at a price worse than the current market okay which is based on your view then and then based on your view you put a sell stop order at 68 uh, 68.70 point 68.709 that is just below 68.71 this is clear <coughs> So, and we have shown you how to place orders in OANDA. So similarly, you'll know how to place a buy stop order. If you want to place a, if I want to place, place a buy stop above this, let's say, say at 72.60, I'm just going to see. So I will place an entry buy. Now I'm placing a buy stop, but it's going to be called an entry, entry buy. What is the price level? 72.60. So I'll place, let's say just a hundred barrels, 72. this clear so this is accepted the buy order now it is showing you that there is an entry buy order at buy order 100 units at 70 to 60 so this is a this is actually a buy stop but it is treated by the system as a uh, <coughs> treated by the system as a uh, buy stop order what are there so much talking going on I don't know who is talking but the noise is coming from this side okay so 7260 is it's just stacked side. So is this clear? I just wanted to make sure that you know how to make the uh, enter all three types of orders. Okay. Or, sorry. Validity of the order you can check. Uh, maybe there's a see you can set the defaults here under user user preferences. Um, trading. Under trading you can um, default entry order duration one week. You can set it to three months also if you want. Okay, so there's a default setting. Every order will be valid for three months. Okay, so uh, that takes care of our order entry. Okay, most of the other things are done. Okay, <coughs> so let's. Uh, 
So this part has already been covered in the previous class. I'm not just I'm not covering it anymore. You can listen to the uh, audio till the uh, you know, the video. You can watch the video towards the end. So all these things have been covered. Okay. Now let's just briefly. I want to just cover before I go on to the next part. I want to just go through the cases, uh, the case questions. <coughs> so, in categories of risk and credit risk, there was a statement great counterparty walks away from me. So, that is under which category? Sir, there is a credit. Okay. That is under why is there so much talking going on? Double A two. Double A two and Bola. No, I think I think I know double A two. Okay, who will write down? Okay, I can do it now. I don't want to waste class time, but Lakshay just write down double A two. I was not no, no, no. I was watching. Somebody is talking here. I don't know. But we are not talking. Okay, fine. Okay, we'll give you the benefit of the doubt because since I actually did not see. But okay, let's have. No, I didn't actually see him. So some noise is coming. I need to have a dog or something in the class, you know, which will go and bite whoever is talking, so that uh, I'll know who is talking. <laughs> We have now we have three black black dogs no, in the in the uh, in the institute. <laughs> okay, guys. Now, what are the key? Uh, sorry, first I have to answer your question. You are asking about um, three one thirty is also too much. Okay, um, trade counterparty walks away from deal. So it's a good question uh, to clarify this point. So credit risk, okay, when we are looking at risk books mainly, as I said, we are looking at market risk and credit risk. So in credit risk, credit risk can manifest in two ways. One is that the borrower defaults, which ILFS, ILNFS is not able to pay its loan or its interest installments. Okay, so borrower defaults. Okay, this can happen in consumer credit or uh, wholesale credit also. So that's a clear cut example of manifestation of credit risk. The other manifestation of credit risk is that if you look at a situation like this, let's say that uh, <clears throat> you had done a deal. Okay, let's say you are say Deutsche London and you have done a deal with Lehman Brothers New York. Okay, where you have sold them oil, you sold them say 10,000, you, you have sold them 10,000 barrels. Let's say it's an OTC deal that you have done. Okay, you have sold them ten thousand barrels of uh, crude oil at seventy-seven ten. Okay, you've done a deal with Lehman Brothers New York, and now uh, so Deutsche is selling and Lehman is buying. Now the price has dropped to this point, and at this point Lehman Brothers goes bankrupt. Okay, which means they are not going to be able to service their contracts. They don't have any money, so they can't. So whatever they were, so let's say that was a forward transaction. Okay, so this happens today. And this particular deal that you had done, okay, where you have sold them oil at 7710, this deal was for one year forward, okay. So now we can now we will deduct Ayush. Now just write Ayush. Yes, sir. Ayush is again trying to become the champion on uh, negative scores. So write down Ayush's score, Ayush's team. <laughs> you have to do something about him, no? You need to uh, muzzle him or something. Like all the dangerous, uh, you know, all these uh, Rottweilers and all, they have muzzles. There. So, okay, maybe we should put a muzzle on Ayush so he doesn't talk. <laughs> so, put down Ayush as a negative mark. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, what were we saying? So, let's say you have a deal which is one year forward. Okay. You have one, one year forward deal which you have done. So, the transaction will be settled one year later. Okay. So, you did the deal on which date? 4th of October. Roughly 4th of October. You did this transaction, you sold one year forward crude oil at 77.10 to Lehman Brothers. Okay. Now what happens is on 22nd of October, 
Lehman Brothers goes bankrupt. Okay, so that means they're not going to be in a position to honor any of their contracts. Okay, so now what happens? See, remember what you did on 4th of October, you wrote out a contract saying they sold 10,000 barrels to Lehman Brothers for one year forward at 77.10. Maybe that was a squaring of a position that you had. Maybe you were already long 10,000 barrels. Okay, I'm just giving an example. Uh, and uh, you had sold to square off that position. So you were long 10,000 barrels from before you squared off that position by selling 10,000 barrels to Lehman Brothers one, one year forward. Okay, and you thought your position was squared off. Now remember that case that we did in lab? Jamal, Jamal AKS Jamal versus Mullah Daud. Same kind of transaction, sale of shares. The seller delivers the shares, but the buyer refuses to pay. Okay, same kind of situation, this exact same situation. Buyer has gone bankrupt. So, ba problem of, a problem of payment can arise on two, uh, due to two reasons. Either there is an unwillingness to pay, or there is an inability to pay. So, if the buyer goes, if the counterparty goes bankrupt, then there is obviously an inability to pay. Sometimes people like maybe in Malia's case, to some extent, this is true. There's just willful defaulter. Basically, he has the money, but doesn't want to pay. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> so he's taking advantage of that, you know, the separate entity rule, which is for the corporation. So the corporation doesn't have the money, but he has other funds. So anyway, so as a result of which now, now your situation is 4th of October, you thought you had squared off your long position of 10,000 barrels by making a sale of 10,000 barrels to Lehman Brothers. Okay, for one year forward. But now on 22nd October, you discover that that sale was effectively almost like no sale at all because the guy is not going to be able to honor the contract. So that contract is now uh, unenforced. I mean, essentially, you can enforce the contract through the bankruptcy process, but effectively, and it's going to take a long time. So it's almost like you don't have that contract anymore, which means the sale that you thought you had made, that you effectively, it's like you didn't make that sale. Is this clear to everyone? Yes, sir. Okay, so now you better, now your long position which you had maybe got at some other higher price, now you're still long, you're effectively long at 77.10 itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're long 10,000 barrels, that is Deutsche London is long 10,000 barrels of oil at 77.10 itself. So this is what you call another, manif this is another example of manifestation of credit risk. Okay, where you have a contract on which there is a lot of profit. Okay, there's a lot of profit on this contract for Deutsche London because they have sold at 77.10 and the current market price is 69.80. So there's a lot of profit for Deutsche London, is this clear? The profit, the contract on which there is a lot of profit, okay, but then the counterparty defaults. That's when also you have another example of a manifestation of credit risk, okay, because of the failure of the counterparty to pay, okay. So credit risk is always a case of a failure of a counterparty to pay. Either it may be a failure to pay a loan, Okay, which is what you see in uh, Kingfisher and I ILFS and all these cases. Or it could be a situation where the failure to honor a contract, which is also something you're supposed to pay. You're supposed to pay uh, for 10,000 barrels at the rate of 77.10. You're supposed to pay that, right? So, so, so failure to pay that amount according to the terms of the contract, that is also an example of manifestation of credit risk. But I'm highlighting these as two different kinds of sources of credit risk because the circumstances are quite different the circumstances are quite different okay uh, in terms of the way that the uh, the seller faces uh, the risk is this clear now your question is clear uh, yeah. okay so we go back to the contract is made like the Deutsche Bank is selling to Lehman Brothers the contract is made the payment is not achieved if you want one minute, one minute. if you want to cancel these orders you can just click and cancel <coughs> We'll just cancel these orders. These prompts also you can change. If you go into the default settings, if you don't want these prompts to come every time, you can uh, knock off all these prompts. Okay, yes. What is the Mr. question? Mr. Dorishwagai has made the contract with the Lehman Brothers New York. The contract was made but the payment was not received. Oh, because it's a one year forward deal. So that means the settlement will happen? On the day of execution. Well, after one year. Right. So transaction date plus one year. Settlement date will be one year forward. That's why that's why you have a problem. If it's a spot settlement, then you have only two days of risk. So normally that is not considered very risky. Okay. So normally if you go into a now some of you have gone into risk, but obviously two of you have got jobs in risk, but there is consumer credit risk. But the concept is quite similar. The con concept is that typically if you see if you're working on the wholesale side of the treasury and you're looking at risk limits. 
you will see that the further out you want to go, if you want to do a five-year deal with some bank, the limits will be much less. Okay, if you want to do a spot deal, the limits will be much higher. Okay, if you want to do spot, like right now, there's a lot of questions about Deutsche Bank, about many of the Italian banks. Okay, there's a lot of questions about credit risk. But your spot dealing limits will be quite high, but your uh, uh, further forward, the, uh, the limits will be much less. Are you able to see that? Because the risk of a counterparty going bankrupt over five years is much higher than it is over two days. Is this clear? So that's why the longer term limits will be much, uh, the trading limits will be much less because you don't want to be exposed. Okay, so we want to come down to now. Okay, I want to quickly cover the case questions. Okay, first question, key risk factors. Now we know what the key risk factors are. What are they? Look at the... Yeah, yes. What are the key risk factors? Okay, then? <coughs> now, let's be more specific about this. Strictly speaking, what you should say, let's try and answer this also here at the end. Um, So here itself, just loosely, I'm just going to look at answers. Okay. So key risk factors, spot rates for those three, that is fine. Okay. Now, as far as the foreign exchange part is concerned, strictly speaking, remember these loans are, we have said there are like 10 year loans or something. No, there is a speed. Aussie loan has what? 10 years maturity. 10 years maturity. Yen loan has eight year maturity and a fixed interest rate. Both are fixed interest rates. Okay. Now, strictly speaking, what we have to say at this point. So the spot part is very clear about the uh, commodity positions. Okay. Now, uh, as far as the currency positions is concerned, we should actually say. Um, yeah, we are at the bottom here, right? We should actually say. Uh, 10 year, I'm just writing it here. FWD forward, everyone understands? Yes, sir. Okay. And similarly, we should say, here it is, 8 year forward. Okay. This is what we should simply say in terms of the key risk factors. Okay. But in terms of your management, if you look at this platform, if you look at this platform, then uh, these rates that you see, this 112.72, okay, this stuff that you're seeing here, um, these are all spot prices, okay? These are our spot prices, okay? So you're managing the risk using the spot positions, okay, using spot market, uh, using the spot instrument, but actually the exposure is for forward. The reason we are doing it this way, there is also a logic in this. Partly we are constrained by the platform, but also partly because the we have to learn a little bit about forward rates here. We will not know everything, but a little bit. So what we can say is that the forward FX rate giving you all the terms that might possibly be used so that you know that if any of those terms are used they are referring to the same concept okay so all fx swap prices simply fx swap prices okay now if you remember so this is what are we learning here now at this point you're kind of just memorizing this 
okay uh, I'm not explaining the concept we'll explain that later on when we go into all the discussion of products so it's like I'm just telling you that to the north of the United States there is a country called Canada I'm not telling you don't know anything else about Canada but you know that okay to the north there is a country called Canada so I'm just giving you some basic information which you memorize at this stage and then we will discuss the details later so the forward FX trade essentially is I'll give you an example also so let's look at some uh, let's look at the Netanya page where we have the forward prices and uh, in dollar yen we'll see a very significant difference so the spot dollar yen is 112.73 let's say so if you see here on net dania i'll just put this also into the link although we have done it before um, so first just let's read what we have written here that the forward fx rate okay as i said at this point you may not understand some parts of it but just understand it as an overall statement this forward fx rate okay the forward fx rate is of is derived by taking the spot fx rate and adjusting it adjusting means plus minus from the spot fx rate adjusted by this fx swap points okay fx swap points which we can call them fx swap points let me put inverted commas here so that we have or fx swap differences these are all referring to the same thing okay these are called fx swap points or they are called fx swap differences or fx swap premium discounts okay these are more, more common terms but this common you can also refer to them obviously as fx swap prices okay but this last part is the least common okay so is this clear yes. so fx forward rate if you want you have to take the spot rate and let's do a minus plus adjusted by the fx swap differences okay so let's take an example how would it work if you see dollar yen spot is 112.73 if we take your um, it's taking a long time to open i'll just use any spreadsheet Okay, let me just use any spreadsheet and go here okay so 112.73 okay and what I do when I look at the net Dania dollar forward prices what do you see let's say we are looking at one year forward dollar yen okay this is too big yes one year forward dollar yen okay one year bid and ask is minus 360 is changing actually so 363.5 and 361.5 so i'll take it as 363 okay midpoint of this is a bid and ask i'm just taking it as a midpoint of the two okay so you see here it says minus 363 and uh, minus three uh, so i'll take it as minus 363 okay so see what i'm doing now this is one minute that we'll come to later that we can't cover now okay right now i'm just teaching you what is some basic stuff okay so it is minus 363 okay so it is 363 we'll just write as 363 pips okay but if you these are given in these are all contextual knowledge okay these are quoted in pips okay so i happen to know that so i'm going to divide it by 100 one pip is uh, in the case of dollar yen, one pip is the second decimal point. Okay, so 0 0.01. <coughs> so 363 pips, what you saw there, that price, that 363 price which you are seeing here, this is 363 pips, which means because the pip in dollar yen is the second decimal, 0 0.01. Okay, that is the convention. Okay, in the case of euro, the pip will be fourth decimal or sterling or you those cases. Dollar yen, euro yen those yen cases will be second decimal okay now this is not conceptual this is just knowing about it so I divided 363 pips means 3.63 if I'm going to quote it on the same basis as the 112.73 spot rate okay so you have the spot here I'll put this in your spreadsheet later on okay swap okay uh, this is the swap adjusted okay that is 3.63 in terms if i want to now now that it says minus okay and we have other ways to figure out even if the minus wasn't there so here what will happen is now the forward is going to be i'm going to just take this 1273 minus this is going to be the forward are you following 
Is the font size big enough at the back for me? Uh, you've seen how the forward rate is derived. Okay, it is derived by just adjusting the spot rate by the FX swap difference or the FX swap points or the FX swap premium discount. Okay, in this case, the dollar happens to be at a forward discount. Okay, the forward discount, what that means is that the forward rate is lower. The forward rate is lower. Okay, if we say that the dollar is at a forward discount against the yen, okay, in the foreign exchange markets, then what that means is that the forward price of the dollar is lower than the spot price. Is this clear? Okay, and uh, if it was a forward premium, then this would have been something higher than one <coughs> It would have been higher than the spot price okay so that's why they are called fx swap premium discounts now we'll come to there's a lot more logic behind that uh, a few a lot of concepts to be learned there but now at this point we are only just discussing this question because we were just discussing this question in the sense of what we are saying strictly speaking when you look at a book like that because these loans are payable one is payable eight years from now one is payable ten years from now okay so obviously if the forward fx rate consists of those or sort of is composed i mean it has two components to it the spot rate and the swap difference okay so the total forward fx rate could change due to change in either change in the spot rate or change in the swap difference either of the two components if they change it will change the outright forward rate the forward fx rate is this clear <coughs> this is just mathematical because you have a plus b is equal to c so then c can change whether a if a changes or b changes <coughs> Either way, C will change. So, <coughs> so that's why we say that the exposure or the key risk factor in this case is the eight-year forward dollar yen and the ten-year forward Aussie dollar. Okay. So that's why we said in the case of the two, I have not written down the answers to the first three, so that is spot. Okay. Okay. Is this clear to everybody now? Yes. Little bit. You're not expected to understand why it is minus. That all we'll do later. Okay. But essentially, this I can just tell you briefly. This is at a forward discount because U.S. dollar interest rates are higher than yen interest rates. Okay. There's a principle called covered interest parity. You can read about it in advance in your book. You have a blue book given to you, Shapiro Moles. Not been given to you. But your course is almost ended. I have already recommended this textbook at the beginning itself. Uh, Shapiro Moles and there is one Jayanto Basu or some Indian author also. International financial uh, international financial management is the name of the book. You haven't. So that means you guys got only one textbook for IF, IPM. Yes, sir. Okay, then I'll tell Lalita why she is not given this textbook because I had already given the name much before. We have to give the names much earlier. Okay, all right. Uh, so is this clear so far guys now what will happen is one sec as I said a plus B equals C so C can change either if a changes or B changes but in practice what happens is this stuff if you observe if you observe it on your own time if you see it okay uh, don't get restless there's still almost 10 minutes now Ishan is packing for the last half an hour <laughs> okay now uh, if you notice, in fact, if you observe this throughout the day, you will see that the the uh, forward FX uh, the FX swap points, they they are much less volatile than the spot FX rate. You can confirm this for your, yourself, but I'm just telling you, okay, that the forward FX uh, points, okay, the FX swap points, they they are obviously moving. Can you see that? They are changing. Are you able to see that they are changing or not? It used to be 360. Three, now it has come to be closer to 361 yeah, midpoint they are changing right they are changing because they are derived from interest differentials okay euro deposit interest differentials so as those change they will also change these are not static but they change much less uh, violently than the spot fx rate okay the spot fx rate movement you can see if you want to see how dollar yen moves you you already may have some idea okay if you look at one week movement of dollar yen it's quite a lot of movement okay so and earlier also you will see if you will see long term charts so the spot fx rate moves so the bottom line is it's the same thing actually there's those swap prices fx swap differences those are actually spread positions if you have a position in the fx swap that's a spread position okay and if you have a position in the dollar yen spot that's an outright position okay so remember what we said about the relative volatility of outright versus spread positions which is more volatile or which is more risky 
outrights, right? So the outright positions are more risky because that those uh, rates move around much more. They are much more volatile. Okay. So the FX. So this is basically why you can actually effectively manage a forward FX position by just hedging in the spot. Okay. There are some cash flow issues which we are not going into now. But effectively, what that means is, is A plus B equal to C. But uh, A and B are not equally important. Actually, the spot FX rate is much much more important in determining the forward FX rate. Okay, in the changes in the forward FX rate, the spot FX rate changes play a much bigger role because those things move around much more as, as compared to the FX swap points. This stuff moves around much less. Okay, you can see dollar forwards. This stuff moves around much less. FX spot rate will move around much more. So if you have a forward FX exposure, it is sufficient to be able to manage the spot component of the exposure. Okay, and then there's a cash flow issue which you take care of. We'll discuss it later. But if you take care of the spot, uh, just focus on the spot price and manage your position on the spot, uh, as far as, uh, with respect to the spot rate, uh, you will you will be able to sufficiently cover your foreign, forward foreign exchange risk. This is clear. Okay, so that's why we manage it through the spot because it is much less volatile and uh, much more volatile. Okay, is this making sense? Some of the material I've not told you. But are you following the basic structure? Yes. Sir. Okay. So that's why, although you have to say in terms of your uh, <coughs> key risk factors, strictly, strictly speaking, you have to say it is actually eight year forward dollar yen, ten year forward Aussie dollar. But in terms of the way you manage your project, you are actually going to be operating in the spot market. Okay. And you have learned a little bit about pot rates and uh, FX swap points. Okay. Next question. What are Magma's underlying positions already been covered with you? All done. Okay. Decision problems. This has also been covered. First three questions have all been covered. Okay. One minute. That's no, it's not all. There's still a lot of time. We have to cover many, many things. Okay. So we have to cover now what we are going to go into is your uh, coverage of um, because we need to cover these uh, elements, all the, uh, so for your own knowledge of, uh, now you find these notes, please make sure you read these notes at the end of this. Um, no, what not got, it's there at the end of your okay. firms, functions, okay, below, below, below your OTC markets versus ETM, okay, you have all these notes, we are going to discuss all this, just to make sure that you have, um, we are going to move into the financing part. The second part of uh, IFM is basically the first part is risk management. Second part is on capital raising, capital? capital raising or financing basically. Okay. So these are the two most important roles of a CFO, raising, managing risk and raising capital. So we're going to move into that and then we are going to cover these elements. Okay. Let me start on it already today. Well, somebody is saying I'm very low. There are seven minutes left. No, sir, Six no, minutes left. Sir, no, one minute. One minute. Let's start quickly. We don't have time. We are very, very tight on time. One minute. No, no, I don't owe you anything. You owe me. You owe me. Okay. All right. So, is this better now to do it in the classroom as opposed to a finance lab? No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. No, no. But actually, it's better for me. I can keep an eye on who's talking. So it's harder to keep an eye on who's talking in the finance lab. Why? Sir, it is very difficult to see over here, sir. Why? No, but I think it's a little odd. It's a little odd to do it in the finance lab because I'm also not able to see you guys. So, so anyway, we had some sessions there. We'll let's do it some some here as well. What? Yeah, so we'll do those here until we can reconfigure the lab. What I've learned clearly is that we have to reconfigure the lab to bring the projector so I can stand in the front part and operate my PC. So I have to bring that projector cable all the way to the front. That needs some work. Okay, guys, this sheet I'm going to put into your uh, into your folder. Okay, and this is connected to the notes as well. Remember when we started out, we started looking at the landscape in the of the financial services industry. So since you're doing a major in finance, you have to understand first what people guys see people, you know, you will have this problem. People use all these terms like investment banking without knowing what it's actually uh, involves. Okay. So you need to learn the classical terminology, understand what these different firms, what they do, what are their functions. Oh, who's talking here? 
There's still too much talking going on. Uh, maybe it's harder. Maybe we'll go back to the finance yes, yes. Maybe it's easier for me to see oh. who's talking. Yes. <laughs> because the guys, uh, they are unsuspecting, right? They think that I don't see them. Here, whenever I turn, I'm not able to see who's actually talking. Okay, let's see. We'll do one more class here and then uh, we'll see. Okay, so the first thing you have to, you, you have to study this format, okay, and start reading the part which is in your notes uh, in this uh, part of the notes, this file below the ETM OTCM part. Okay, what are we going to cover here? Okay, first is depository financial intermediaries. Okay, I'm going to go through them quickly because we need to spend some time on capital raising banks okay as far as we are concerned we understand this to be banks okay <coughs> so why are they called financial intermediaries because you have three types of people you have basically you have savers Deposit. okay savers are depositors so let's call them depositors okay you have depositors you have banks and then you have borrowers okay so depositors can be both natural and artificial persons could be companies, firms, etc. Could be individuals, depositors. They put money in the bank. Okay. Then the borrowers also could be both uh, individual. Uh, we can just uh, the correct way to refer to it is to say natural and artificial persons. Okay. Because you can have consumer credit like credit cards, bank, uh, housing loan, student loan, all these kind of things. These are natural persons. And then you have lending to companies like ILFS. Those are artificial persons. Okay, so the correct way to define the uh, entities are natural and artificial persons on both sides as depositors and as well also as, as borrowers. Okay, and in between you have the banks. Okay, so that's why why are they called intermediary because the bank is standing. So it's not going directly. The money is not going directly from the depositor to the borrower. It is going through the bank. Okay, so that's why the bank is an intermediary. Okay, it's a financial intermediary because financing is involved. Okay, and it is a depository financial intermediary because it is taking deposits. So remember these terms. You have to remember the terms correctly. Don't talk in a loose manner. These are depository financial intermediary. There are others who are not depository intermediaries, but they are financial intermediaries. Okay, they are yeah they are depositories because they take deposits. Okay, so the depositor is just lending money to the bank directly. So these are all. There are two principal to principal transactions happening here. The depositor versus bank is a principal transaction, principal to principal. They are depositing money with the bank. And then the bank to the borrower is also a principal to principal transaction. Is this clear? There are two principal to principal transactions here. And there is financing going on through this mechanism. Okay. So that's why banks are called depository financial intermediaries. Okay. And what do we have? We have two, uh, two minutes. One minute. One, one minute and 20 seconds okay <laughs> so this is finance commercial banks i'll just give you uh, and then we have non-depository okay so you raise you understand all this okay NBFC. make sure you read all this on the nbfc's i've given you a high uh, a hyperlink to the rbi faq on nbfc's if you okay. want to read more about our local market okay that is not so important for theoretical factors but more to know the indian market okay and what the rbi regulations are Okay, so you have to study all this stuff and then we'll come back and we'll quickly discuss this then we'll move on to financing. This will help us to understand financing also. Okay, so I'm giving you a grace of a few seconds. Good. Okay, so you can go now. For, for Usain Bolt, this is a lot of time. So I'm giving you a lot of time. Okay, anybody has any technical questions before I close the recording? Questions technical. Yeah. Can a person be a hedger and an investor at the same time? Like you were saying the fund manager of the company is the Investor is not a term. Investor is not a term that uh, applies uh, relative to the hedger. Either you say hedger, you say it as a hedger or a speculator. Both say investor. Investor, that's actually like a layman's term. The, what you should use is the word speculator, not investor. 
So you can't be both at the same time. Hundred dollars. Okay. You have bought. Yes, I have bought it at hundred dollars. Okay. No, I have bought it at hundred price. Third price is hundred dollars. Okay. So I place an order of MIQ one zero five. To exit the profit. So if the just so and the price which is one zero five. So and then it comes back. So the entire patient will be executed at one zero five. It depends what type of order did you leave? What type of order did you leave? Limit order? MIT. MIT. If you leave an MIT order at 105, yes, okay, and the market is at, one, at 100, yes, sir. then if the market trades at 105, then the system will activate a market sell order. So whatever is the next price, it's a market order. Because if you have left market if touched, market if touched with a parameter of 105, then as soon as the market hits 105, the order is activated and the system will release a market sell order. So whatever it's the next next price it will sell. Whatever. Any price. Market price. But if like in, uh, in case of limit orders, it will be generally more than 105. It has to be. If you have left a limit order 105, then when the bid goes to 105, okay, then the market then the system will try to sell it at that bid. Or better.